on this episode of Skeptico, a show about looking for a hero. The final part of the secret is that you deserve to feel miserable. Look at you, so robotic, so vain. Any bit of culture you have is ruined by self-importance and egotism. There is no doubt you all are in need of a hero, someone brave enough to confront me and control me. But this will not come to pass. I am the villain you are stuck with. Besides, what hero would want to save you? And finding it very, very close to home. Like in the mirror. And it's in many ways anti-human, anti-life. It's just like, ah, humans or whatever, we should just enhance ourselves and forget about it. So I have this very skeptical conspiratorial lens of what's happening in the world. I think we need to be very careful about some of the things that might sound benevolent and maybe some of the people involved have a benevolent intent, but who knows, what could that do to our soul? It is love and light, but we've got to be tough. And that's something I don't see as much in the spiritual world. That first clip was from the very excellent Mouthy Buddha. And the second is from today's returning guest, Mark Gober, who came to talk about E.T. and wound up talking about a lot of other stuff as well. Stick around. I think this is a great conversation with a truly, truly great and important thinker. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome back Mark Gober to Skeptico. Mark, if you're at all familiar with the show, especially the last couple of years, you will definitely remember the interviews that we've had with him. The first was a few years ago back, he wrote this really amazing book, an end to upside down thinking, dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness, duh, and the implications for everyday life, or we should say really the implications for the psyop that wants to tell you that that duh isn't a duh and that you should really take that seriously. But Mark does an awesome job, awesome job of breaking that down. He's also written several other books in this upside down series, but his latest really caught my attention. And even though we did an interview with him not too long ago, this is, I mean, this guy is really such a next level thinker and it's just always fantastic to talk to him. But here's the latest one. Check this out, because this is, this is challenging. An end to upside down contact, UFO aliens and spirits and why their ongoing interaction with human civilization matters. Wow. I mean, that is, that is really powerful stuff. Mark, welcome. Thanks for coming back on. Well, thank you for having me, Alex. You know, I was just teeing up chatting with you for just a second. And I was saying, you know, my big question when I get to this topic, and I always think about this, and I never articulate it is, are we flying too close to the sun here? And I think all your books risk doing that. But I always wonder when we talk about this stuff, like I don't have like a big, huge profile or anything like that, but I am genuinely concerned when I talk about this stuff because, and we'll talk about that, but I, I prefer to kind of dispense with the bullshit and get right down to the nitty gritty is like, this is like a central question to our society, our culture, the manipulation of our society, our culture throughout time. And does there reach a point when, you know, even though you look around and you say, well, gee, other people are talking about this for people who are successful and have made it inside the game like you have and I have. I know this is like a huge question to start off with, but it is the question. Do you wonder, do you worry? Am I flying too close to the sun? You obviously don't think you are because you published <laughs> this book, but what do you think? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Alex. It's something I think about a lot because my quest since I started this six years ago had my personal, the beginning of my personal transformation has been to get to the truth because I realized that whatever I thought about life was completely wrong. And it's been a, a quest since then and it's ongoing. So that's been my compass is to try to get to the truth. And... um 
I get pulled in these directions and I just kind of can't stop it. So I do try to be mindful of doing it in, in a diplomatic way as much as possible and just presenting facts because the things that I'm presenting are all publicly available. And I try to draw some lines between things and try to help connect the dots, but I'm presenting things that are already out there. And I've made the decision repeatedly that it's worth doing it because I think as a society, we are so far away from the truth. I mean, myself included, I don't feel like I understand it. It's just mind blowing that we're all going through life with these big central questions about our existence. Who are we? Why are we here? Who do we coexist with? How does it all work? We don't know the answers to those questions. So to me, that's what matters in life. I mean, there are other things that go along with it, but I, I haven't been able to pull away from that. So I've just decided to go with it. Well, that's, that's great. And uh, you know what I think you do really well, and you've done it again here, is you kind of bounce back and forth between that big picture stuff that you just talked about and the practical implications for how you're going to go about living your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's terrific. And I think that's what separates this whole field that we're in here, this podcasting, talking about this. It separates the infotainment stuff from the genuine quest for the truth. I, I, you know, I started so long ago, I felt like I was flying under the radar to just be able to talk to the people I wanted to talk to. Infotainment was the furthest thing from my mind. I just wanted to be able to talk to these people. And the game has really changed now to the extent where it's all about, you know, entertaining people, which we have to do to a certain extent to have any kind of voice at all. But what I really admire about you is what you just summed up right there. I really feel that I'm talking to someone who's trying to figure this stuff out for his own personal betterment to like, what, what is, what is this all about? Not just to entertain somebody. That's, that's been my goal. I want to figure it out for myself because I'm really curious. And then I get this urge to share it with people. And that's how the books come about. I mean, I didn't know I was going to write a first book and then people were asking me, what are you going to write next? And I said, I have no idea. I would say that right now. It's just, I go with what's next, what feels right. But it is, like you say, I want to understand the truth. Because if we don't know the truth, how can we really know how to live and to prioritize things in our life? Well, uh, speak to that for a minute. I know that's, before we dive into the whole alien thing, and I got a million, million, you know, we can go in a million directions there. But that's a really important point to start with, is this, how do you understand that? How do you understand your personal view of why the truth is important, how to pursue the truth, what that means on your own spiritual journey, on your own moral, if people are uncomfortable with spiritual, on your own kind of moral, ethical journey. Hmm. Well, I think about this all the time, every day. So it's evolving. But I, my sense is that we, we exist to evolve our consciousness. So we're evolving not at the bodily level so much as we are the spiritual level, the aspect of us that inhabits the body, if you want to call it a soul, the part of us that extends past this body. That seems to have perhaps an infinite life, and we are going through a reincarnation cycle. There's lots of evidence from the University of Virginia, over 2,500 cases of children with past life memories. And if you combine that with the evidence of the life review and near-death experiences where people relive their lives at a time when their brain is either barely functioning or completely off, they become the people that they impacted during their life. They get to feel those feelings. So if you put those together, it, it teaches us that we're perhaps evolving through our lifetimes. So morally, you always talk about this, Alex, the moral imperative. I think there's something built into the nature of reality itself. And Dr. Bruce Grayson at UVA has found in talking to near-death experience survivors that this is natural law. It's beyond morality. This notion of a life review and what some would call the golden rule of wanting to treat people well because we're interconnected. So that is part of what guides my compass is, is wanting to, to treat people well, and that can manifest in many ways. I think getting to the truth helps with that, with that cause, because when people are more awakened, they will align in that direction and might not be as susceptible to some of the traps our society places on us. And one of the things I wonder more and more is. I don't have an answer to this. Are there things in society that push us in a direction where we make decisions that are not in our best interest, even though we might have a good intention and we're manipulated? 
So I've more and more in that mindset, you've been in that mindset for a while and trying to uncover that because that hopefully could, if we uncover it and get to the truth, then there might be less suffering or less unnecessary suffering. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to just stick to the spiritual because I'd love to, we could talk about it all day. But to me, that is the essence of the deep spirituality that this quest for truth brings, because as you pointed out just a minute ago, and you keep circling back to it, because it's central to the whole thing is, how could there be any goodness, any realness, if it isn't fundamentally true? I mean, if it's not fundamentally true, then it can't be fundamentally good. It's mm. got to be tainted. So to constantly be searching for what is true is the same as searching for what is is good. To me, they're, it's, it's, I don't want to get too philosophical, but they're almost indistinguishable. And I think this deception part of it, I don't think it has to be something that we are angry about or we're out, you know, go get our AK-47s about. It's just another part of the truth of the reality that we have to understand is that does that conform to how you've seen it yeah and what you're describing in a way is this dichotomy of good evil that many talk about and another way of describing good evil in the way that i look at life is that it's just a mechanism of evolution it enables us to learn things so we could get really angry about stuff that's evil and to a certain extent that makes sense, but at a higher level, there is learning to be had from it. So that doesn't mean we ignore the manipulation or the evil. It just means we put it in the proper context that this is part of reality and it's important to acknowledge it rather than put our heads in the sand, which is one of the phenomena that I've been witnessing a lot of that, that really concerns me, especially in the spiritual community of let's just look at love and light, which is part of the story, but you're going to miss a lot of the potential manipulation if you're not attuned to how deception works. Okay, so with that, we've been bouncing around the topic long enough because all the points that you're making are brought forward in a new way, in a challenging way for a ton of people it's in this book, An End to Upside Down Contact, UFOs, Aliens, and Spirits, and why they're ongoing. I mean, every one of these words we could spend, you know, time on. ongoing. How long has it been ongoing? How do we know it's been ongoing? Is it, you know, and, and what does ongoing mean? Ongoing means they didn't, even if we put a date on it, like, oh, 1947. Oh, no, it's back further than that. Oh, Bruce Fenton recently on. Oh, it's 780,000 years ago. So if you go back, how far do you go back? And, and so anyways, and then interaction, I'm just taking the, the title of the book, you know, we could break down every, what does interaction mean? I can't stumble through this whole thing. We'll, we'll just have to have you tee it up, <laughs> the, the finish the title with their, why their ongoing interaction with human civilization matters. Okay, Mark, I, again, I'm, I just get excited and I start rambling. Break down the title for us. What does all that mean to you? Well, Alex, I really appreciate that you focused on the word so closely because that's what I do when I'm writing the books, and especially the title. Each word is very meaningful and I go back and forth with things. So I, I landed with that as the subtitle. And so the series of books, which of course at the beginning, I didn't know it was going to be a series. It's all about things being upside down, meaning that the way that we look at X, Y, and Z is off, is off base. And I had come across the topic of UFOs and other intelligences that exist seemingly in the universe in my past research. But, and even when we last talked, which wasn't that long ago, I didn't know I was going to be writing this book. I wasn't planning on it, but I was, for whatever reason, got pulled down this rabbit hole. I knew I knew pieces of it, but not some of the details that I talk about in the book. But I realized this, this notion of contact broadly is really important. And when I say contact, people usually talk about UFOs. There's an a cor a correlation there that people usually associate. Um, and that's part of it is that UFOs, whatever these crafts are, that's a big piece of the puzzle that there, there might be a non-human intelligence involved, but maybe it's not just UFOs. I mean, in, in near-death experiences, people encounter deceased relatives, beings of light, spiritual beings, and lots of other things. So that's when I talk about contact and UFOs, aliens, and spirits, I'm talking about all types of contact with other intelligent beings, which suggests that humans are not at the top of the food chain, which is to people on your show and, and your audience, it's probably not such a big deal to think that way, but that's a paradigm shifting idea 
for those who haven't thought about it, because there's this implicit sense that human beings are the top of the intelligence food chain. What if we're not? Um, so that's that's what I get into in the book. And this notion of an, their ongoing interaction with human civilization and why it matters. The word ongoing implies that this is happening now and has been happening for a very, very long time. How long, I don't know, but it seems like it's very, very far back. And that's what one of the things I examine in the book is the the evidence for not just UFO or non-human contact since the 1940s, because we've had a lot of cases since then, but way before that, way back to ancient times and who knows, maybe even earlier. And it seems to be happening now and probably will be going through the future. And in terms of why it matters, um, I mean, if there are other intelligent beings, and we should get into this, how intelligent they might be, it might be incomprehensible how intelligent these beings are. It it means everything. We, how can we examine anything that's happening in the world without thinking in the back of our minds, well, there are these other intelligences who might be interacting with us in ways that we can't ordinarily perceive with our eyes. And before I pause, I want to give an analogy that I mentioned in the introduction to the book, and I mentioned it in one of my other books as well, because it relates to spirituality in general. The notion that we are, we have a limitation in terms of what we can perceive naturally. And the analogy I give is from the novella Flatland, where people are living in a two dimensional world, like a flat piece of paper. Now, if you imagine for a second that a sphere intersects with this two dimensional world, a three dimensional object intersecting with the two dimensional world, the people in the two dimensional world will perceive a circle because they're only in two dimensional land. All they can see is that circle. They don't see the full sphere. And what I wonder more and more is if we're like the people living in Flatland who can't even perceive these multi-dimensional realities, we get a sliver of it, but so much more is happening and actually uh, potentially interacting with our world that we can't perceive. So great. And before I kind of jump in there and take us in too many directions, you know, cause I'm like rapidly jotting down notes as you're talking about this. But here might be a more interesting way to kind of approach this. Mark, as you kind of go forward with this book and you bring it out to people, and then you're kind of joining this public discourse that's going on, which is all over the place. I mean, this discourse on the UFO community and even people who are being sucked into the UFO community and never thought they would be part of that community, but now it's so much a part of the standard dialogue. What are the conversations that you are being drawn into right now that you think relate most to your book and the issues that you're raising in the book? What are two or three of them? I mean, I can spot some of them from what you've just said, but I want to know what comes to mind for you. Sure. Well, one is what we're seeing in the public discourse these days with hearings about UFOs. It's becoming a more mainstream topic, even relative to a year or two ago. This is something that everyone's acknowledging that there's something going on and we might not know it. Maybe the government knows things that they're not telling us. That's what I think. But it, I'm saying the mainstream thinking now is there's something happening. So that's one area that seems to overlap with just general thinking in the world. I can't let you off even on okay. that one. So you, you you put one on the table. Okay. What's, what's Mark... Gober think about that? How do you look at that from this expanded view that you have now, this conspiratorial view you yeah. have, and this expanded view of extended consciousness? I mean, I juxtapose that to the hearings and I come up with, a, with one view, but I want to hear what your view is. Yeah. I don't trust anything we're being told. That's my view. But it's in the public discourse, whereas it wasn't as much you know, as of a few years ago. So people are talking about the topic. Are they talking about it accurately? Maybe a tiny sliver, you know, the fact that these crafts exist and they can do things that, that our modern technology can't do, or maybe secret programs can do. They're acknowledging that, but I think much is being left out. The really important stuff is being left out. Yeah. And if I could just add on that point, and I want you to tee up the other ones so we don't just spend all the time here because sure. we could, but They've done a very uh, effective job of changing the narrative immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can start with, you know, we got to name names like Lou Elizondo. He is a counterintelligence guy. I mean, why is a counterintelligence guy being the one to t tell you about UFOs? It's it's fake from the beginning. It's Richard Doty 2.0. It's strawberry ice cream. It's the, you know, Richard Doty, famous 
Paul Benowitz, you know, unbelievable mind control of someone who just a flag waving American who spots UFOs on a Air Force base and in service to his country says, hey, you know, should do, don't you want to know what's going on? And boom, who shows up? Counterintelligence. And they start playing these mind games on him. How would we see, uh, uh, how, how would we understand the current round of what's going on as anything different from them from that and if we wanted to then what i'd say for lou elizondo is the first question is how is this different are you going to at least come clean that you were to engage in this kind of massive misinformation disinformation that's provable and then you know that would have to be the starting point for anything you're going to say now and you know i interviewed a colonel john alexander a few years ago and I don't know that I trust or believe, you know, a lot of his stuff too, because again, he's an intelligence guy, but at least on the Doty thing, he comes out and says he should be in prison. He should be in prison for what he admitted to. We don't even have to prove it. He acknowledges that he went and did all this stuff to Benowitz. The, the, what he gives as an explanation for why he did it is a pre-disclosure explanation because that's the other thing that's at play here like with the hearings is we have to realize that everything before you know 2018 and 2017 was before disclosure so it was the the official position was none of this stuff is real so any kind of kookification oh that guy's just kooky that guy's crazy was totally supported by that whole apparatus but after that after it comes out in the new york times then it, it's no longer that so I, I, I've laid a lot on the table there, but not really. It's all in this same thing of like, not only why why would we trust them, but it's like, isn't the burden of proof on them to show that this isn't a, a, a completely rigged misinformation game? Yeah. Well, especially looking at the history of UFO disclosure. I mean, looking at Project Blue Book and just the history of deception and a lack of honesty. Uh, they're not, they have not been forthright historically. So why should we expect that they're telling the full truth now? And when you put that in the context of everything that's been happening with COVID and all that other stuff, consistently we're, we're being told things as true and they're turning out not to be so true repeatedly. So the burden of proof is on the authorities constantly in my view. And that's how I look at it. And probably why I've been so motivated to tr dig in for myself because I feel like the so-called authority figures that we're supposed to trust repeatedly are not telling the truth or they're withholding the truth. And in order to get to it ourselves, I don't think we can just trust what the media tells us. Okay. So we have that. That's a great point. What are some other ways that you feel like this book is intersecting with the public discourse on this topic right now? Well, to me, the, the other thing that comes up is what some would call a spiritual war between good and evil. And on the surface, if you just look at what's happening in the world, the temptation might not be to think about supernatural forces. We see individuals on TV making policy that we may or may not agree with. Sometimes we find out that they're not telling the truth or that they were very confident about things that they end up being wrong about. But what I continue to ask, given what I now believe about extended consciousness, and if you think about the brain as an apparatus that actually receives information or also could be perceived as a filtering mechanism, meaning there's things that are blocked out, but things that can get through, then you might wonder how are people being influenced, sometimes consciously, sometimes not consciously, to work for forces of what you might call good or evil. And in order to answer that question, in my view, we have to get to the metaphysical good evil which is one of the things I try to get to in the book, is that yes, there are multiple dimensions and yes, there are intelligences out there, but some of them appear to be very benevolent and some are completely evil. And to me, that, that can't be completely disconnected from what's happening in the world. I don't know the exact connection, but there's gotta be something there. And as we talked about in my last interview, I tend to be very concerned about the erosion of liberties and moving toward a transhumanistic uh, Orwellian world Where's that coming from? And at the same time, we're not there yet. We're not fully enslaved. We do have lots of freedoms relative to where we could be. So if it were fully evil, right, we probably would already be in this enslaved state. There has to be a balancing act too. And that makes me really curious about what our role is in that. And what I conclude in the book is that there's only so much we can control in the external world, but we can 
what we can control is ourselves and what we decide to tap into individually that we're going to try to tap into what we call good and try to discern so we're not manipulated. And I'll just pause there. No, don't pause there. Keep going. We got to know how you arrive at that uh, kind of metaphysical understanding of good and evil as it as it relates to this topic. It is the like you said, it is the fundamental question. How are you breaking down the data? How would you and how is the way that you're breaking down the data? How is it different from the way you see other people breaking down the data? And because this is directly relevant to the conversation, right? Is, is it a blob of consciousness kind of thing? Is it do what thou wilt kind of thing? Is it, you know, ET is good, the space brothers, uh, save the planet? Is it, you know, this, this is the discourse. So the fact that you're tackling this again, that's what I'm saying. This is so unique. I, I, it shouldn't be so unique, but it's tremendous that you're doing this. How, how do you break it down? How do you make the case either way in the book? Why do you come down the way you do? Yeah. There's so many directions I want to go here. Let me preface what I'm about to say with the fact, again, that our perception is limited. And I want to talk about also the idea that our perception can be skewed by these intelligences. So something you've talked about in your show, and I talk about in my books, because we have to start with this when we talk about good and evil. Things like screen memories and shape shifting. So a screen memory, you had Mike Cleland on your show a few years ago. He's famous for his work with owls, where owls seem to appear at UFO encounter sites. And then a person might go under hypnosis to try to uncover what happened during missing time that might be associated with it. So the person saw an owl and then a few hours go by and they don't know what happened during that time. This happens in UFO encounters very often. The time seems to be missing. There's a memory gap. And they go under hypnosis to try to see what happened during that missing time. And the hypnotherapist might try to guide them and say, well, can you describe the owl that you're seeing? And the person will say, wait a second, this isn't an owl. This is a gray alien. Okay. And it's known as a screen memory, meaning the thing that the person consciously remembered is not what is uncovered when the memory is more fully unlocked. And this ties into what many people have reported. And even John Mack, the former head of psychiatry at Harvard Pulitzer Prize winner has reported in the people that he studied who claimed they had abductions, that these alien beings could shape shift, that they could appear one way and then appear another way. And many people have anecdotally reported this. I mean, I can't show you the scientific statistical data on this, but it's reported repeatedly. Now, if we accept that to be true, then with regard to good and evil, we have to also be wary of the trickster beings who could manifest one way but maybe they're not that way. So as in the in the quest to look at good and evil, we have to be very discerning. And I don't have a great answer for that because these beings seem to be so much more intelligent than we are. If they have the ability to manipulate our memory, to create missing time, to appear one way to us. And I'll give some other anecdotes from my book. Again, again, these are anecdotes, but it's come up multiple times where uh, there's a sexual encounter with a woman and what appears to be a man. And then the woman realizes that that apparent man is some sort of an alien being, but seems to be able to shape shift in a way that manifests as what the woman would consider to be attractive. This also happened with a man I mentioned in my book, Matthew Roberts, an ex-Navy guy who had an experience where the being during it, and it's, it was sort of like a dreamlike state, but not fully a dream. The being was sort of switching its face and then landed on his ex-girlfriend during um, a sexual encounter. So I give that preface to say, we don't know what we're dealing with all the time. We're dealing with extremely advanced stuff. And I'll let you respond to that before I, I go on. Uh, well, I guess I'd, I'd do it a couple of ways. You were so tuned into like such an important issue because I, I almost feel like I want you to come around the curve to the other side of it because what you've laid on the table is really great. And that's that we have to have this level of discernment because we already have evidence of uh, mental slash consciousness, whatever that means, manipulation at this level far beyond what we know. But I guess I will babble on for a minute because this is like seems like an interesting point that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but you just laid it right out. I look at like uh, Sirhan Sirhan. And anyone who's looked at kind of the old conspiracy stuff understands 
you know, Sirhan Sirhan is the guy who shot uh, Robert Kennedy, right? Assassinated, apparently. And he's a Manchurian candidate. It's just clear as day, couldn't be clear that he's a Manchurian candidate. And there's even evidence people have done the, the work that you can kind of pinpoint the time when he was pulled into the MK Ultra program. And the reason we know that is like they found more bullets in the kitchen where Kennedy was shot that were in the gun. And number two, there were eyewitnesses, eyewitness is there, including, you know, like the old football player, Rosie Greer, who grabbed his arm right after the first shot, all this stuff, Manchurian candidate, Manchurian candidate, where a lot of people don't go with that is if that was the state of the art technology of our intelligence agencies, our alphabet soup intelligence agencies, 60 years ago, then where are we at? And I put that on the table because as you're doing so, okay, now let's extend that to ET, whatever that means, who we understand intuitively by all this stuff and by reports is more advanced on that continuum of mental manipulation, consciousness manipulation. And we have it all over the place, like you're saying, screen memories. And my go-to on that is always it related to the ones you mentioned in the book. But, you know, Ray Hernandez, his wife is having this incredible kind of traumatic encounter and he walks halfway down the stairs and then he turns around and he says oh that's nothing the voice inside his head his own voice says oh that's nothing that's silly go back upstairs and go to bed and he does right so that's like classic to me but that's repeated over and over again or you look at uh you know i, I won't go on and on because you already made the point we're making the same point but the, what do you think about that in terms of to what extent have we advanced our technology since we seem to be imitating or, or we seem to be in this technology exchange with these advanced civilizations that pops up all over the place mm -hmm. but i don't hear a lot of people talking about the technology exchange as it has to do with consciousness manipulation what that what might that mean and then back to the bigger question that you're raising is how do we then still apply this level of discernment that you're looking for and i'm looking for and i'll just end with saying i think you're spot on 100 that we still can it is still very possible it is the essence of who we are to always to be able to discern if we apply the right internal processes to ourselves so what do you think about some of those issues? Yeah. Well, I think about mind control generally, one at the level of secret programs that have been uh, declassified, but there are probably other secret programs that we don't know about. And, and I say all this stuff as someone who's not an insider, like I don't have any government experience. So I'm just, I'm guessing. And there's probably a lot I don't know. I, I should just clarify that. Uh, but we know what was going on with MK Ultra in terms of being able to manipulate people and dissociate the personality. That's key is to create multiple personalities where the personalities are essentially hidden from each other. And when you could sw you switch one personality on, it would have certain traits that had been programmed into it. So you could have someone that is a secret killer, but then it's other personalities, just a normal person. So given that that technology exists, again, it's very difficult to know what's going on in the world because you could have someone who has had a mind control, has been under going mind control, really not due to their own consent. And one of these programs gets switched on and we don't know how advanced that is. So I think about it from that lens of what individuals are being programmed. And maybe that could relate to ET. Maybe they're tapping into dark forces. I don't know. But uh, so there's this individual level. And then the other level is collective mind control. And when I think of that, it's like what's been going on with COVID? How can they use mass media and fear in particular to get people into this state where maybe they're having a mini dissociation because it's often called trauma-based mind control. And I think about that a lot because it's the next trauma after, after the next on the news. And what's that doing to put people in a fear-based state and then making them more susceptible to whatever the messages are? It's almost like a hypnotic form of mind control. So that that's what I think about in response to your question, Alex. Okay, but Mark, at the end of the day, you come down on the side of good as being kind of the the meta <laughs> yeah why how, how do you how do you get there with all that other stuff that's going on well it's an inference it's an inference based on i guess two things 
One is my own internal state, because that's the only thing I only I truly know. And I know what my emotions are like. And when I get pulled into a dark state versus a light state, and I just have this, this intuition that the light state, the love state is the one that we're headed toward. And that intuition seems to be validated by looking at the people that have had spiritually transformative experiences. So look at the near-death experience. People say, it's ineffable. I can't use words to describe it, but it's unconditional love. People say that in certain meditation experiences, certain psychedelics. I had a glimpse of that that I talk about in my second book, An End to Upside Down Living, and I've been asked about it. Only a little glimpse during meditation where I felt this sensation. I don't really know how to explain it, but it was beyond love. It was just this total bliss out. So given all of that, I think that we are, that's the the high level is good, but there's there's something in between that's getting in the way very clearly. And this leads me into what I was trying to get at before, before I got into screen memories and all that of where I think I'm talking about things that I don't see as much elsewhere, but I see you talking about it a lot, which is what, what evil actually is, how dark it is. And you've gotten into some of the the ritual abuse topics on your show. That's something that I've looked at and talk about in the book. It's a level of evil that most people cannot relate to because most people are, in my view, are, are pretty good. I mean, everyone has the dark and the light within them, but some of this stuff, the, the violation of other beings is incomprehensible and it's it's a paradigm shift to learn about that stuff. And what I find is that people don't want to go there, which is understandable because it's so disturbing, but it's also very problematic because then one spectrum of good evil is totally off base. And I see it happening all the time where you might see people in the public who they appear to be very mean or something, and that's evil. And like, yeah, sure, that's not good. You know, we could say that's bad, but on the spectrum of what, you know, what real evil is, it's nowhere close. And when you know that that level of evil exists, it opens up the possibility of all sorts of nefarious things, which start to make the world make a lot more sense, actually. It becomes very conspiratorial, but you can't get there unless you know that this level of evil does exist. So for me, because I've known about some of this stuff for a few years, and I mention it very briefly in the Liberty book, the one that came right before this. I do it more extensively in this book, but I always try to play this, this balance of wanting to express that these things exist, but not turning people away. And I'll, I'll say one last thing before I pause, is that some of the feedback I've gotten about this book is that some people had to skip certain parts, <laughs> which is interesting for me, because I, I go into the details of what, what this evil means. And one of the conflicts I had in publishing it was, am I am I letting them off the hook too much? Am I not exposing enough? I was concerned about that. I wanted to give the essence, but not turn people away. And in some cases, they even had to skip only small parts of the book. It's not a major part, but it's central to this, to examining the world and thinking about good and evil metaphysically. So uh, again, this to me is one of these central issues that is fully in the discourse right now. And you're so brave, I can't think of any other word to say it, to bring it to the surface like this, because it's funny how it is hidden beneath things, whether it's either the the Space Brothers thing, and I was just listening to an interview with a very excellent Ryan Bledsoe, I, I just kind of feel like he's trying to be totally out there. But at the same time, it, however you talk about this, it just becomes contradictory in terms of the Space Brothers, they're here to save the planet, they're here to protect us. And then, but I'm not going to talk about shape-shifting reptilian aliens that are raping people. I'm not going to talk about the lost pregnancies. I'm not going to talk about the deception. And I just had an interview with uh, Dr. Bob Davis, who was part of the free survey, you know, at Ray Hernandez, and they did a survey kind of mirroring the near-death experience survey work that Jeff Long did, which I think is incredibly important. But, you know, when Bob Davis and I were talking, one of the things that came up is I, I kind of pushed him as like, hey, let's say you're right and it's 80% positive. What the hell does that mean anyway? If there is this other uh, malevolent part out there that is, you know, really, really bad or what we'd call evil, until we kind of, uh, the statistics don't really matter. What matters is what you're grappling with in, in, in a really important way is what is the nature then of this structure of consciousness? Like, 
I'll, I'll kind of I'm, I'm pounded on the same issue, but it is the central issue. It's good ET versus bad ET. Yeah. Well, one of the things I highlight in the book when I, I talk about the free study, and I should commend those who did the free study because it's one of the few examples where we have many, many cases of contact, UFO contact, but beyond. So for me as a researcher, I don't like to focus everything on one anecdote. And that was a great way to say, look, there's 3000 plus cases here. They do tend to focus on the positive cases. But what I highlight in the book is, yeah, it's a small percentage, but they do say they're malevolent beings, some of them. And you don't need a, a lot of malevolence to create big damage. So, um, I mean, this is also something I talk about in the Liberty book where, and if I'm getting off topic, let me know, but I think this is also central where you could have just a small number of people with really horrible intent. And if people around that evil don't see it, then they can be easily manipulated and thinking they're doing something that's good and just following orders and not being able to comprehend uh, that there could be deception behind it. So it's critical that, yeah, there could be a lot of benevolent beings and there, there seem to be, if you just look at the many, many cases, people have had positive experiences, but there are some negative ones too. And we have to think about what that means in terms of what they could try to enact. And I'm, I'm now thinking about this, you know, the theories about alien abductions. It relates to what you've been talking about. What are abductions? Are they good for us? Are they bad for us? And you had some great interviews several years ago that I went back and listened to with the Mary Rodwell, David Jacobs debate on this. So Mary Rodwell and also John Mack to an extent viewed abdu abductions. And I assume your listeners know about this, but an abduction is when a person is taken apparently aboard a craft and they have all sorts of procedures done on them. This is typically against their will, although some people argue that at a soul level, they agreed to it, but it doesn't appear to be voluntary at the time. And sperm and eggs are taken. There seems to be a hybridization program that people talk about where the alien beings are creating a, a species that's part alien, part human. It sounds insane, but even John Mack from Harvard was talking about this and like imp crazy implications. But the question is, what is this good for humanity or bad for humanity? So in one of John Mack's books, he says, you know, he gathers from talking to lots of abductees that this is part of an evolutionary insurance program where if things really go haywire on the planet and they need to repopulate, then they're going to have a species that's hybrid. And some people have also talked about seeding other planets with this hybrid species that the advanced beings are doing. Um, so that's one side of it. That's more benevolent. Sometimes people come back with miracle healings. And sometimes they have spiritual awakenings as a result of this stuff. And I should mention the work of Kenneth Ring, who studied near-death experiences, University of Connecticut. He wrote a book called The Omega uh, Project in 1992, where he compared near-death experiences to UFO encounters. And he found that there were many commonalities, even though the experiences themselves were different. There was an element of trauma to both of them. In a near-death experience, you almost die. And it, with the UFO encounter and an abduction, you're you know operated on and so forth. But typically, people became more spiritual and not more religious, but more spiritual is what he found following these experiences. Sometimes they had even kundalini awakenings. So these are very positive things in terms of awakening the planet, because if a person has such a shift, their whole life changes. And that's what Dr. Grayson finds at UVA as a psychiatrist. Their priorities change when they have these spiritual awakenings. So that's the positive side of all this. Dr. David Jacobs from Temple University and also Bud Hopkins, another UFO researcher, was sort of on the side have a different take on, on these experiences, which even John Mack would acknowledge there was a lot of trauma that can come from this. And if people didn't properly integrate the trauma, he acknowledged they could have a really hard time with this. This could be bad for their psyche. But where Jacobs and to an extent Bud Hopkins go is that this is, this is a, a dark agenda. They're not creating hybrids to help humanity, but this is about planetary takeover. That's what David Jacobs talks about in his book, Walking Among Us, written in 2015. Now, what I often think about is David Jacobs wrote that book in 2015. John Mack passed away in 2004. So I wonder what he'd think now, because David Jacobs has said that what he's hearing from abductees is that their story is changing. Over time, it has shifted where the abductees are starting to, and I will preface this by saying it sounds insane. <laughs> they're telling him that they're training the hybrid beings to be more human, because since they don't live here, they don't, they don't really know how to interact. And he gets into some crazy sounding details, transcripts of, of what these abductees are saying, of teaching hu human alien hybrids the very basics about how to be a human and to live on this planet. He actually calls them hubrids, the advanced hybrids. And the goal, he says, uh, based on what people have told him, is to create a hybrid that is indistinguishable from human beings. 
on the surface, but they have some kind of an enhanced mental capacity, an ability to use mind control and telepathy, and they tend to have a, a lack of empathy, which could be considered on the on the spectrum of psychopathy, like a psychopath. And so he sees this in totally a malevolent way that they're here to take over. Now, I don't know where I fall on this because it could be that some of all of them are true to some extent. You could have different species that have different agendas. You could have different beings within different species that have different agendas, just like on our planet. We see a big spectrum. We have psychopaths and we have saints. So it's very difficult. I, I notice a tendency for people to try to make this a monolithic phenomenon, that it's just one thing, they with a capital T. I think it's it's diverse. And so I'll pause there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I, I appreciate you pausing, but don't feel like you have to, because I mean, you're on a roll, and it's going to be dense no matter how we do it. So let it fly. Don't worry about that. Of course, it's going to be level three. That's the only way we can talk about this. I mean, we could take any one of the points that you just made and dissect them for like an hour. It, I, I Again, the one thing I'm always coming back to in the back of my mind is this central, most important thing about this book, Upside Down Contact, and that is how do you then process this, go through the discernment process that you're going to going through and try and figure out how you leave your, live, live your life? You know, do you just kind of give up and say, well, I don't have any control, forget it, whatever the my alien overlords you know, want, I guess I'll just wait and see or I'm, do what thou wilt, you know, let's be very Crowleyan about it. Just, hey, uh, none of this has any meaning anyway. It's all being run by some other, you know, we're in some kind of illusion, some kind of simulation. Just do what you want for own gain. And I would even take like that kind of speculation It break it down into this one point that you made. Again, we could break it down 50,000 different ways, but the whole thing of psychopath and psychopathy is so interesting the way that it's worked into our culture, because a lot of people would take the proven aspects that you document in the book, upside down contact. And you would say only a psychopath would do that. And they would therefore conclude that these can only be understood as malevolent beings. And someone else would do exactly what you did and say, well, it kind of depends. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Maybe you didn't do this, but it kind of depends on perspective. I mean, is like in our whole, uh, you know, pandemic kind of post pandemic world that we live in, the whole thing is globalization. Is globalization good or bad? Is one world government good or bad? Is the idea of 147 tribes running around with hatchets, chopping each other up, and some of them even have nuclear bombs that can destroy the world. And you look at our history of how close we've come to actually doing that. You know, which is which is worse? You know, what's worse? I'm not saying I buy that at all, but I'm saying that argument can be made outside of, in my opinion, the psychopathy kind of argument. You don't have to be psychopathic to say, hey, that's a better kind of thing. On the other hand, we can look at true psychopathy and, you know, the snakes in suits and how someone with just kind of almost normal uh, negative intent, you know, because like the kind of intent that we see, like the serial killers and the John Wayne Gacy and all, we, we can't really wrap our head around that other than in some kind of metaphysical kind of thing that we won't even go there because it kind of muddies the waters but just in terms of greedy mfs that just want more and more and just have an insatiable appetite for power and money and control much more relatable you've been around those people in your professional life you know that you can still go to lunch with them and have a good time with them and hang out on the weekend with them and have a beer they're they're not like impossible people to deal with they're just stuck in that way and that so there is this more nuanced view that we have to have of what psychopathy means in our world and and also in just in terms of from a practical standpoint because I, I so appreciate that you again have this practical uh business as well as kind of legal frontline soldier kind of mentality that understands this that it's it is complicated and it is a 
get things done kind of world and that takes different people and in some cases you would tend to move towards the, the the psychopathic person as somebody who is can't be very focused on getting things done so as you look at the spectrum this is a difficult question but it, and i think you partially answered it with multiple species multiple agendas multiple agendas within multiple species you know kind of thing but how how do you overlay that then on upside down contact this idea of motivation and maybe even psychopathy or you know ill intent kind of thing yeah well i agree with a lot of what you said what if we look at the far end of the psychopathic spectrum, I mean, I'm thinking things like ritual abuse, where there is an attempt to invoke dark beings through the torture of another human or other living being. And actually trying to, you had an interview with Tom Zinzer talked about this to actually build an attachment through the dissociation of the personality to summon dark beings. To me, that as far as what I've come across, nothing is more psychopathic than that. The desire to totally violate someone um, and metaphysically, I don't know where, well, I have lots of questions about what that means. Is there a, an attempt to extract the positive energy from human beings for their own benefit? And it's a purely selfish energy. That's kind of where I come out if we're on the far end of the spectrum where it's purely selfish and there's no hiding it. But then we can move in the middle of the spectrum where it's like, well, I'm going to do this thing. It might harm some people, but it's for the greater good. And I'm ultimately being compassionate. It's like this utilitarian uh perspective, which might have aspects of psychopathy because it lacks empathy in certain areas. So you could have people in the world who really think they're doing good with their policies because they're thinking in a purely collectivistic way. This is something I talk about in the Liberty book because I, I get really concerned, especially with the spiritual community, going overly collectivistic. We're all one. Yeah, that's true, except that we're all individuals within the oneness. And the minute you ignore the individual, that gives permission to say, well, the individual doesn't matter. And the worst crimes you could think of in history is when governments go fully collectivistic, whether it's fascist or communist, the individual doesn't matter at all. Um, so somewhere within there, there's the desire to do good, but there's a manipulation and it becomes psychopathic. And then from there, I think you move into the quote unquote good uh, spectrum of you know whether it's just a normally good person or someone who's fully saintly. And I also want to touch on what you asked about living life uh, practically and how to deal with all this. Um, there's a story that I, I constantly come back to. When I was, after I wrote my first book, and ends upside down thinking, I was looking a lot at like how to live life if you accept post-materialism, basically consciousness doesn't come from the brain. And I got into a lot of the non-dual teachings and the spiritual teachers, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. One of the teachers I often talk about is Dr. David Hawkins, who was a uh, top psychiatrist who became very spiritual and uh, allegedly reached very high states of consciousness. And one of the stories he often told was that when he was elevating and reaching these states of enlightenment, there was a phase when it felt like it was just him. And then he, there was this, it seems like a being, he calls it a knowingness, a, a voice that came to him and said, look, you've transcended all of your personal karma. All power is yours. Take it. And what he said in a split second, because this just came to him, he said, wait a second, if I am everything, why should I take this power over others? And then he said he transcended and went to the next level. Now, I don't know if the story is true, but I love the, the moral of the story. He claims he was shown the beings that did not take the temptation and those that did take it. And he said the ones that did take the temptation had a horrible karmic fall because at that level, it's the consequences apparently are worse if you, if you make a bad decision. So the point here is that uh, these forces seem to try to get us in our weak spots. That's a theme that seems to be coming up everywhere. They can manifest as the really dark, explicitly psychopathic, or it can be this, oh, just take the power over everyone. And I wrote about this in my book, An End Upside Down Living, when I cautioned about spiritual teachers, because there's lots of examples of the fallen guru that takes the temptation. And it's usually money, sex, or power. Mariana Kaplan talks about that because she's analyzed these gurus, where it gets you in some way. So this goes back to your question about the spectrum of, you could be really good, but these forces might come in and try to tempt you in a certain way. And it gets to where initially I wanted to go with all this about how I think about living. I do think it's about the evolution of our consciousness, but part of that is like the protection of our consciousness, the protection of our soul, which starts to get into a lot of the, what the spiritual traditions have talked about. But I, I feel that way more and more because it seems like these forces are intruding upon us, especially if we look at what's happening with COVID and the jab and all this stuff where it's like, it's impeding on your life. And you've, you're either going to go along with it or you're going to set boundaries. 
And that's an important part of living as well as just trying to achieve unconditional love. They both go together. You mentioned Ken Ring and you mentioned him in the book and the near-death experience and stuff. The, the deception, like that's why I was so intrigued with why people didn't talk about Lou Elizondo as if it's a real kind of thing when it's clear that it isn't. So back to the Ken Ring before I digress too much. And you might remember this and I don't remember if it was in the book or not. But near death, he, so Ken Ring is looking at the parallels between near death experience and abduction experience, while well, a lot of things are the same. And he gets this group of people that have had this really positive thing and they say, wow, the Space Brothers are here to save the planet. And as a matter of fact, if we don't get our ass in gear, the planet's going to destroy, be destroyed in 1988. 1988. They put, and independently, they kind of, Several of them come to the same thing. And lo and behold, there's this woman in England and she isn't even associated with Ken Ring, but she has, you know, 1988 becomes the date. Hey man, that date comes and goes and where is it? And there's like a million examples of this, but people are so susceptible to like, it, it, it ties into so many things you're saying and then I'll just let you riff on it however you want. But we got to be, as much as we want to believe that they're here to save the planet and, and help our environment, discernment, I'm not sure that's really stands up to a careful scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah, all good points. I mean, my, my view and approach to all of this is to present all sides of the evidence because I really don't know. I mean, I know based on my own personal experience, which is super limited because I haven't encountered these beings, at least as far as I can remember, I haven't, um, because you never know what has been blocked out of our memory. And I do come across this positive Space Brothers theme repeatedly that they are going to save us and don't worry because they're going to take care of everything. And when I hear that, I get really concerned when it's like, don't worry, we're, you don't need to do anything. That mentality, and I actually end the book and end upside down contact with that theme of, yeah, there could be positive beings and maybe they're going to come and maybe more advanced beings are incarnating on the planet, like people are saying, but that doesn't take the onus off of us as individuals. I think it starts with the individual and it's a collection of individuals who are elevating that's going to do it. The minute we offload it to someone else, I think we get into big trouble. Yeah. And I take it even one step further and let's break it down to another level of logic and reason. And, you know, that's where you come at this stuff from. You are a smart guy and you're not afraid of applying your intelligence to this thing. And it comes through in the book, you know, where you're kind of reasoning this thing through. It's like question number one with on ET in everyone's mind is you're being deceptive by not disclosing. Right. If, if, if whatever you say, uh, then come forth. You obviously are in, in charge. You have power. Go ahead. You want to riff on that for a minute? No, go ahead. That, that, I agree with you. So, I don't want to yeah. You. Yeah. So no, tell, tell me what, tell me what you think uh, about that. Because again, it, it's like such an obvious duh point, but it's, which is kind of what your books are about. It's like, duh, you know, upside down thinking it's like they're in control. I, they could, they could land on the, cliche is land on the White House lawn, they could do that at any time. Right. And they're, right. why aren't they not doing that? And that is in of itself a form of deception. So that automatically should bring about some skepticism. So I agree with you. And it it reminds me of what a lot of spiritual teachings talk about when they when they talk about these other realms. They just say, be very wary because they can, these are beings that can manipulate you. They can appear one way and they're not actually that way. So many of them say like avoid psychics, avoid channeling and all that because there are potential dangers. I think there are maybe good beings too, but how can we discern some of this stuff if there's so much more advanced? We might, it might have a difficult time sometimes, although like you say, there are hints and we have to learn those hints. Like when they start getting into grandiosity. You know, I always think about uh, Robert Hastings when I do this. And he's somebody you mentioned in the book, but just for folks who don't know, terrific guy. And, and I had an email exchange with him. I was trying to get him for an interview and he's not in good health to do interviews at this point, but he has done the most complete review of UFOs and nukes. That's his thing. And you've seen him on a bunch of TV shows and stuff like that. And he's interviewed over 100, 150 of these kind of senior military personnel who were at these uh, 
Air Force bases and other bases or flyers and stuff like that that were protecting the nukes. And there's this interaction between UFOs and nukes. And I'm not, I don't want to bury the lead here. He says, 20 years ago, I thought that this was like the UFO giving us a warning shot across the bow. Hey guys, come on, step up to the plate, be better human beings, protect the planet. Come on, we can all in this together. And he said, it's shifted and I'm paraphrasing, but now he says, I've kind of come to understand it as, ah, it's kind of in our mutual interest that you don't do what you're doing. And that just so struck me to the core of, particularly in this kind of level three conversation we're having, that's not necessarily uh, malevolent, that isn't necessarily right. bad, but it might be a level of reality that, uh, back to the very beginning of this discussion, until we're willing to and able to explore that, that truth, that potential truth, it totally, it switches everything. We don't have a chance of even pretending we can understand it if we're not even willing to balance those two because they take us in two completely different places, right? Yes. So two things I want to say, and I remember what I was going to say before because it's related to this. On the topic of UFOs and nukes, and I should just say that book is unbelievable. It's like, I don't know, 500 pages long. The amount of detail he has from interviewing over 150 people at these facilities, it's hard to read that and not think something's going on. And I'm, it's one of those things. I mean, I, I spent so much time reading since I, especially since I left my job, there's so much information in books and people are busy with their lives that I can understand it, but the information is there. And this is one of those incredible resources. But what I came across in my research, uh, not directly connected to what Hastings said is um, Philip Corso's son. And so Philip Corso, for those who are not familiar with them. He wrote a book called The Day After Roswell, published in 1997. And he allegedly, there's lots of controversy over whether or not this is true. He was involved in research and development using the technology collected after the Roswell crash in 1947. And allegedly, a lot of that technology shows up all over the world in stuff that we use because they recovered at the at the crash site. So he wrote this book uh, talking all about it. He even saw a gray alien that he describes in the book and other other lots of other crazy details. He passed away. But his son is still alive and is talking about it. So in, in his son's interview within the last few years, he talks about what his father told him about Edward Teller, the father of the, the atomic bomb. And what Teller told his father was that the alien beings became much more interested in Earth following those detonations because the detonations somehow impact other dimensions, which impacts these beings. So they have been showing up more often since the World War II era out of their own interest. Maybe it's mutually beneficial too, but they're going to protect themselves because it's actually harmful for those dimensions to be altered. Now, I don't know if it's true, but it it ties into what you're saying. And it's an important consideration that, yeah, they might want to help us, but it's helping themselves too. And then another topic, the one that I was going to mention earlier is um, a notion that I've heard a lot with regard to the, the allegations of the Galactic Federation, which I don't know. I mean, I can't prove it. I have no experience with it, but I hear it talked about a lot. And uh, the Farsight Institute, you've interviewed Dr. Courtney Brown from Emory University, who runs a, a separate remote viewing group that looks at historical events and also current events using remote viewers uh, to try to figure out what's going on. And one of the comments he made in, in a recent interview about the Galactic Federation, which he claims has come up in lots of different uh, remote viewing sessions, is that the beings are benevolent, but they don't want to intervene because it's our karma to learn for ourselves. I don't know. Um, so if you apply that to the UFOs and nukes, is it maybe sometimes they're intervening on it to try to help out and give us a warning like Hastings initially thought, but in other cases, they're letting us learn on our own. I just toss it out there as one of these other theories that, that you know, benevolence, but it's like not a fully uh, interventionist benevolence, if that's true. Yeah, I, I got three points. I want to make sure I hit them all. And Apologies to anyone who can't follow this conversation. <laughs> Too bad. Uh, the first is, did you happen to catch my interview, my multiple interviews with Bruce Fenton? Yes. So again, I'm not like driving a stake in the ground and saying that's totally true or anything like that. But the reason I think it's like super important what he's bringing forward because is that one, I love the way he's approached it in trying to tie science to it to at least add some credibility to what he's saying. But the really important thing is he's flipping the script with the date. 
So he's saying, okay, 780,000 years ago, the terrarium, the experiment, the zoo begins with them coming down and starting a genetic engineering program on, on humans. But what is also said as part of that is, hey, man, that, that, it sounds so modern day, like, hey, there's this one group over there and they're pretty good and they want to do stuff, but ooh, there's this bad group underground. Oh, and then they blow up the ship. So then let's come back and we'll blow up them. And, you know, I mean, this is like Star Wars and it's 780,000 years ago. So I think like one of the places that takes me as it relates directly to your book is consciousness evolution, question mark, you know, are we, how fast are we evolving? But then even more importantly, I, I would totally agree with you. It, th th forget about that. This is a drama. This is a play that's playing out. It's the personal, the, the, the very personal, close your eyes and look at that spot between your eyes and you are in another dimension right now. So you don't even have to speculate about all this other stuff. It's internal to you and that's all you have to worry about kind of thing. But I, I, I want to hit all these points I don't know if I should go through them one by one and, and pause on each one or, or tee them one. all up. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tee them all. So the, the importance there is, oh, the other thing I was going to add is, you know, I did an interview and actually uh, Gordon White a long time ago did an interview with John Brandenburg for Skeptico. And there is even more, I guess, concrete, if you want, uh, physical uh, evidence. He's an astrophysicist. No, he's not an astrophysicist. Uh, but he's a physicist and he's detected uh, a nuclear explosion signature from Mars from what he estimates to be 250,000 years ago. And he goes, look, I've looked at this every way possible. This is my thing. I know how to do this. You know, it, he's kind of very distinguished mainstream career. And he says, this doesn't that background radiation, it doesn't fit anything else. It These isotopes only fit one thing that we know about, and that's nuclear bombs. And here they are, and we can date them back to 250, 500,000 Mars kind of thing. So I just thought that was interesting as it relates to Bruce Fenton 780,000 years ago. And again, uh, in the spirit of what you're doing, you just got to throw that out there and say, okay, what would, if that was true, then how would that change how we think about and for example i think about the good bad thing to me it suggests that we are playing out this drama that's been played out forever and will continue to be played out forever and our true soul journey is at a, is outside of this space time and outside of the space time that the aliens are really it, 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 we're all in this drama. You know, it's like when I talked to Whitley Strieber a long time ago and i remember you know he's got all over the places with i love him but i said you know how close are is this other and he was his answer was immediate he goes oh they're right they're right here they're right at the tip of our nose and he was saying that not just from a physical standpoint obviously but from a consciousness you know how far above are they you know he's no no the right right in our soup you know like does et have a nde kind of thing so that's point one hold on to that okay the other point that you mentioned that i think is so so interesting i don't hear it talked about enough is like philip corso there's all this controversy like oh my god he's such a scam that's fake and look i you know debunked it here and there what's never factored in in my opinion is a before disclosure after disclosure perspective if you go look at the debunking and you put it in now our after disclosure lens it looks crazy. The debunking looks crazy because it's like, oh, you know, well, there wouldn't be any advanced technology. There wouldn't be that. No, we now know there is mm -hmm. advanced technology. We know there's the Tic Tac. We know there's this. We know they lied for all those years. It's proven. You And, and there's never a, a, a retrenching of the debunking, you know, of the debunking of saying, oh, you know, this idea that we had spa uh, space junk and we were distributing it to different companies that were already and the other thing i hear is like hey you know i can show you the path for integrated circuits or lasers and stuff like that well of course if you're going to distribute the technology you wouldn't just give it to some 
Joe Schmo over here is working on something completely different, you'd give it to somebody who's already, you know, halfway down the path. So that, that's point number two is I don't think we do a good job of uh, debunking the debunkers in a after disclosure kind of world. But the third one, you can comment on those first two or not. But this last one, I really, really want you to comment on because I think it in so many ways is at the heart and soul of this book, Upside Down Contact. And that is, do you think we are at some kind of crossover point? And I've always been resistant to that idea. But like when we talk about, like you were talking about, uh, not only when we were talking about Hastings, but when we're talking about the abduction thing and the, the process and the program and all the rest of that stuff. And you look at where we're at from a genetic standpoint. And of course that ties into the pandemic, you know, but, and then what I was interviewing back, back to Bruce Fenton, you know, independent of anything else, he says, yeah, you know, they had to take a jab in order to come to genetically modify themselves in order to visit different planets. And they weren't able to do that. And you're like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> are, are we reaching some point that is that, crossover point in terms of uh, genetics, where we're going to be able to genetically modify and turn into grays or whatever? Are we also reaching that point in terms of technology and AI, a lot of people are thinking about? And then what does that mean relative to uh, how you're understanding the core heart issues of upside down contact? Okay. I'll start with the first one. And if I left something out, just let me know. Uh, so this is regarding Bruce Fenton's work, and I mentioned him briefly in the book. He's doing fascinating work, um, and this notion of ancient contact, and this has been happened. This happened before. Um, what came up as you were talking, Alex, is the notion that we are very new in our current iteration of society to DNA. We have this junk DNA, which is the majority, and we don't even know what it is. So I feel like there's a lot to be discovered there about our true origins and what we are, and it probably does tie into. Bruce's work. And I looked a lot at the ancient mythologies, ancient texts from different religious traditions. I mean, some of this, you never know what's disinformation and what's real. I mean, you always have to be skeptical of that. But very often they were having supernatural experiences with beings that seem to be very advanced. And if you correlate the language to what they were saying and say, well, this sounds a lot like what people are describing today, they just use different language. Like the book of Ezekiel, people often talk about, he talks about creatures and fiery chariots in the sky. I mean, who knows? But there are lots of cases. Um, like that. And the ancient aspect of this is just so critical. I don't feel like I fully understand it. Also in the in the Hindu tradition, in the Vedas, they talk about Vimanas, these flying saucers essentially that were everywhere. Um, so that's on point one. Uh, point two with regard to Corso. I mean, I, I looked at a lot of what you were describing, Alex, when I was reading his book and evaluating the debunkers. And I think it was Dr. Michael Sala who wrote a, a counter to the debunkers. It's, I think, a free PDF he had online. And I was thinking along the same lines as you. It's like these debunkers, their arguments aren't super strong, given what we know now. I mean, I don't know what happened to him. But also listening to his son talk, there are lots of interviews publicly available. He has a lot of conviction. And apparently his, his family has had to go through a lot, like CIA showing up at his house. I mean, paraphrasing. Um, and he, he asked the question, uh, in one of his interviews, why would they do that if there was nothing there? And apparently on his deathbed, his father, Philip Corso said, I wish I hadn't written this book because of all the, all the flack his family had to take. So that that's significant. I mean, I don't know what happened, but his book has so much detail in there. It's just, it's fascinating. So now your third question about, are we at an inflection point basically? And I, like you, have had a resistance to this because basically at every point in time, people think they're at the inflection point. I do think there are differences uh, here because we're at a different point technologically. Although if you talk to people who believe in Atlantis and things like that, they'll say, well, they were advanced like we are, but um, let's say this iteration of humanity, we have a level of technology now where advanced surveillance is completely possible. Like the craziest conspiracy theories people were talking about decades ago, they're not far away where, yeah, you just need to use this microchip or you just got to take whatever we tell you and then you can live in our world um, and by the way, it's mRNA. I mean, things like that. It's, it makes you concerned given the rest of the context. On its own, it sounds crazy. But if you see that these beings are involved in genetic modification and some of them seem to have negative intent, I, I think a lot about what's happening in the world and whether there is some kind of 
dark agenda or maybe agendas. I don't know if it's monolithic or maybe it's monolithic at some level of consciousness, but it manifests as like mafia families. But there's a movement toward people being less free and also less human. Uh, this transhumanist idea that we should just be something else or merge with machines as if what we have is not sufficient. There's there's this movement away from the natural, I continue to see. And it's in many ways anti-human, anti-life. It's just like, ah, humans or whatever, we should just enhance ourselves and forget about it. And it's taking away from some of the core spiritual essence. So when I look at this in the context of everything I've learned, it's incredibly nefarious. And you see little hints of it showing up in different parts of society. Uh, but when you look at it from this lens, I think it's super evil what's happening. So I have this very skeptical conspiratorial lens of what's happening in the world. I think we need to be very careful about some of the things that might sound benevolent. And maybe some of the people involved have a benevolent intent, but who knows, what could that do to our soul? And I don't know the answer to this, but could there be something that keeps the soul from evolving as much because we take away from our innate experience? Those are the kinds of questions that I have. And what kind of answers do you have? And then I'll, I'll tell you my answers. What do you think? Well, I would say they're all tentative, but I, I think we have to be very wary of all this stuff. Um, and like I said earlier, protect the soul. We have to defend ourselves. And I do see that as a spiritual duty. Some people would say, Mark, you're being selfish and individualistic. I see this a lot and there's a divide in the spiritual world about it. But I think the individual is a vehicle through which the spirituality manifests. The one mind, some would call it, this universal love is manifesting through a set of individuals. So we're both the collective and the individual. And you have to protect yourself so that you can be of service. I talk a lot about this in my second book. Like I, I ask the question, what is the overall intention of your life in that book? And I try to get to the answer for myself. And I give a long answer in the end. But the first sentence of it is, paraphrasing myself, is that we are here to try to perfect ourselves as much as we can so that we can be pure vessels for this greater intelligence to be of service. And that means we have to look out and be very skeptical of the things happening around us and not just take what the expert says because that person's on TV and sounds really nice. We really have to question every narrative. And to me, if the last two plus years haven't proven that, what else will? I mean, every narrative has, I don't need to tell you about that, but we should be questioning what they're pushing on us when they say, this is in your best interest. We need to ask ourselves first, is this in my best interest? And I, I notice some people just kind of want to go along with it and not ask that question. It takes a lot of energy to do what I'm describing, and it takes a lot of thought, but to me, it's essential. So how does that manifest in terms of personal practices in your life? I don't want to tag it with spiritual practices because I want it to be broader than that. Just how, how, do, you, how do you do that? Well, I'd say I would divide it into two categories. One is probably traditional spiritual practice. So I do meditate and do breathing exercises and stuff like that. And then the other practice is a general one, which is just learning. I want to learn as much as I can because then I know how to navigate better when I have more information. And that's a practice. Some in the yoga tradition, they call it yana yoga, the, the pathway of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but that that's a practice to me. I totally can relate to that. I think that's awesome. If you will... What does that learning mean to you? Because I could just speak to myself. I can do learning and get in a rut on my learning too, is mm -hmm. that I'm not broadly looking at, you know, developing myself spiritual and the great spiritual traditions, the great spiritual masters that have come before can, and I know you're totally into this, but can provide great learning. But at the same time, current events, your book can be tremendous, all your books, uh, collectively, can, uh, and I'm sure you experience this, because I'm sure people email you and talk to you, can be truly transformative for people who haven't been open to this information, or, you know, didn't even know about it, or weren't open to it before, and you bring a different thing on it. So how do you decide how to learn? It's mm, a great question, and it's evolved for me in these last six years. And even before that professionally, it's it's a trial and error process. That's the way I describe it. Really the whole spiritual path is trial and error. And it's like you touch the stove and you realize when it's hot and I start to pick up those patterns of what, what rabbit holes not to go down. I like to look at everything first, even things that I don't think are true. I wanna know why someone believes it because usually they have a real conviction. If it's not totally disinformation, some people believe things that aren't true. And I wanna know why, like where did, where did their error occur. Because I want to find that for myself. Where am I potentially going wrong? So it's this constant questioning 
process. It's a skeptical process, but also an open-minded one where I want to take everything in. And I try not, so I've also been looking into the psychology of reasoning a lot recently. I mean, I studied psychology in undergrad, but I'm trying to understand the world that we're living in and how smart people can be fooled by things. And there's this psychological phenomenon known as motivated reasoning, where if you don't want to believe something and you find one fact that potentially proves your point, you'll stop there and say, I'm good. I don't need to go any further. It's happening everywhere. So, but it's being aware of those cognitive biases that we have because we all have them. They're kind of innate into our built into bio, our biology. And it's likely for our survival as a biological organism to have these shortcuts, but they can lead to biases that get us away from the truth. So it's a constant questioning process. And I mean, because my my learning journey has taken me on so many different paths. Like at one point, I was I wanted to know all about this really dark, evil stuff, which is taxing to learn about that. It's not fun to do it, but there was this point where I'm like, I just have to know what's going on here. And it's like you cringing reading pages. And then I got to a point where I just didn't need to learn the details anymore. So it's knowing when to pull back and say, I know enough here. Maybe sometimes I'll revisit this in the future. But at a certain point, you pull back from certain topics where it's like this 80-20 rule or 90-10. You've got the essence of it and you don't need to go as far into it. And there are other areas where I need to learn more. And then, I mean, I, I look for things that that seem to have practical value to my own path. And at some points that's learning the spiritual enlightenment path, if you want to call it. Ken Wilber, uh, the philosopher, has this phrase that I like to refer to a lot. He calls it waking up, cleaning up, and growing up. That there are multiple lines of development that we have, and they're relatively independent of each other. So waking up is, yeah, I want to achieve the oneness. But you could have this enlightened teacher who hasn't done the growing up or the cleaning up, and they turn into some kind of a fascist. And we've seen that happen a lot. So I try to hit these different areas in my own growth, and especially over the last two plus years when COVID hit, because I should add this, I was never interested in politics at all before 2020, zero interest. The only time I had some interest is when it related to patent law because I was involved in that space professionally. I couldn't have even told you if it was right or left that cared about stuff. I just cared about that specific thing. And then I realized, well, I need to learn about this, Mark. You can't be ignorant about these topics. So I've had to dive into that in order to learn how to navigate. But also if I'm putting information out there to people, I'm trying to express the truth as much as I can. And there's a real obligation in that to present the truth and not to lead people astray. And maybe part of the reason I've written multiple books and did a podcast series is that I do something and I realize I was missing something. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm incomplete. I've got to let people know if they're reading my stuff. And then it turned into something else. So there, there's a sense of a duty to try to present the truth as much as possible. So for my journey, it leads me into those other areas too. That's really awesome, Mark. I am so appreciative for you sharing all that. And, you know, just to recap some of the things that I took out of that that I thought were particularly insightful is this kind of ability to move from the telescope to the microscope, you know, and to do it fluidly and with purpose of this kind of meta purpose of, wait, there is a there is a me in there, like your first book, Upside Down Thinking. I, that voice inside my head is real and it is directing me. It seems to be directing me from my life experience. I can't deny that. And that's kind of the meta, you know, the meta knowledge that that's what's going on. And then to, I, you used the term earlier and I forget where it was, but kind of cleaning the, cleaning the process or, you know, the, the mechanism, this tool that we have of, our soul inside our body and our discernment thing, we have to keep that tuned up, which is the other part of what you're saying with your meditation work and your just spiritual work. It's like, hey, if, if I don't have that together, then I'm not going to be able to go and refine it in these other ways. I think that's just really terrific. And the way that you put it, I thought was was really helpful. And I think it'll help people understand where you're coming from in these books, because it is a, a reoccurring theme in your books, wouldn't you say? Yes. And I mean, I, I'm deconstructing this myself as I go in the journey. Like I'm able to speak more clearly about things that have happened in the past because I have the, the hindsight view. But as I was going through it, I might not have had the same clarity. And I'm sure the same will be true in the future. Uh, so one thing I would add to it, this notion of, of tuning up the individual, um, 
I think like physical exercise is an important part of that too. And diet, like keeping the physical vessel tuned is really important. And in my second book, An End Upside Down Living, I talk about four of the yogic, yogic paths, which I've kind of combined um, into what works for me. And I, I say that the spiritual path is basically these four areas. One is the wisdom knowledge path. The other is the ser service path. The other is the devotion. And the other, the fourth one is energy, which can be physical exercise, meditation, those sorts of things. So knowledge, wisdom, selfless service, devotion, and energy. I try to hit those four at all points as much as I can. Awesome. So finally, as we wrap things up, that is so inspiring and so positive, so fundamentally uplifting. Relate that, if you will, to this book, which can be challenging. Like you said, people yeah. skip over. I'm sure people <laughs> will be skipping over maybe the whole book. Like, I don't want to go there. But the book, An End to Upside Down Contact, UFOs, Aliens and Spirits, and Why Their Ongoing Interaction with Human Civilization Matters. So overlay, if you will, because it really is the whole thing we've been talking about, how you can do both, how you can manage both. This is one of the challenges in the spiritual path I'm appreciating more and more, which is paradox the ability to hold contradictory or seemingly contradictory ideas together in tandem at the same time and acknowledge that they both have truth to them and they're not mutually exclusive. So I say that and I'm harping on it because there's a lot of darkness that exists and there's a lot of good stuff that exists too. To me, it comes back to the beginning of our conversation that it's important to be aware of this stuff not to get too pulled emotionally into the darkness, but to know about it almost in an unemotional way at times. That can be helpful because the emotions can skew our logic to acknowledge that it's there so that we can steer our lives and hopefully our society in a positive direction. But I don't think we can do that unless we acknowledge the, that these truths ex exist. So back to your very first question about it, my concern about writing a book like this and really all the books, I, I don't think there's a choice. I don't think there's a choice in this. We're going to have to get to the truth Otherwise, we'll be stuck in a manipulative loop. And to me, what's what's the alternative to the truth with that context? I totally agree. And, you know, finally, kind of from a silver linings playbook kind of perspective, you know, well, look what's look what's happened to us. Look for, for all. I, and I'll turn this into a question, but I'll start with myself. The Great Reset for me has been. Uh, unbelievably horrific in terms of what it reveals, but in a way I already knew what it revealed. So it just kind of confirmed it for me, but there was a silver lining to it too. I'm outside so much more. I'm outside all the time because it's like, that's where I want to be. I want to be outside. I want to be living outside. I'm in nature. I'm closer to explicitly close, closer to my family and my kids, not in a way that bugs them too much, I hope, but just in a way of like, why am I sweating about the little stuff? The the great reset is my great reset. It's my personal reset. I'm not going to let them own that reset. And I think I've spoken with many other people who do see it the same way. And it is that path, that hero's journey that you're talking about. It's walking up to the edge of the abyss and looking in and not falling in and looking in and saying, I will be stronger. I will be better because I must. And what do you what do you think about your great reset? Yeah, well, I've certainly had one, and I I left my firm. I gave notice to my my business partners in December of 2019, and phased out of the firm over the first few months of 2020. So I, I had this intuition that I needed to leave my job after I'd become partner. Spent 10 years working my way up. I was in a great situation, great people, the smartest in the industry, and in what they do. I mean, ideal if you look at it from my old world view. Uh, but I decided. I was going to leave and I wasn't sure what was going to be next. It wasn't like I was going to a competitor. I just said, I need to pursue this other stuff. I didn't even have a second book in mind at the time. And then I went on, uh, I went on an Ayurvedic retreat in New Mexico. I went on two silent meditation retreats for about a week each, a little under a week each, one with Adya Shanti and another with his wife, Mukti. So three retreats in five weeks in early 2020, which was a form of a reset for me because I couldn't sit still for 15 minutes before that. Uh, so that got me into meditation. For about a year after that, I was meditating for, on average, probably five hours a day, just sitting, um, feeling this whatever energy coming through, learning a lot too, 
but also just sitting. And it felt like a bleaching. That's the best way to describe it. If you imagine rough waters, the waters became a little more still. And so that that was a big reset for me, but it was also reset in terms of a new paradigm shift. Like I said, I wasn't interested in politics or any of the worldly stuff at all before. Um, and even when I got into spiritual stuff, I was interested in the metaphysical and the reach enlightenment, which all is very important too. But then I realized I got to understand what's going on in the world. And that was a reset. Understanding the extent of evil, some of which I saw professionally, I saw some systemic horrible stuff, which aligns with what's happening in the world. Corruption that most people would say, no, that's not possible. No, it, it's possible. There's such corruption. Um, not not every person, but that that phenomenon exists. I started to see it on this bigger level and it's led me down my own path, which has been incredibly enriching as much as there's been bad stuff in the world that's caused a lot of trauma and death and sickness for sure. That's happened and mental issues. Um, for me, it's been very enriching. I will say the hardest part of it for me has been the fact that our society is, is so divided in terms of the way people view reality. And that makes it practically difficult to interact with some people when you're literally looking at a different world. For me, that was a little bit easier with the metaphysics because you could have a different view on consciousness and still talk about what's happening in the world. Now you can't, <laughs> especially once you once your eyes are open to the conspiratorial lens, you're in a different reality and it's difficult to relate to people in the same way, people that I like in, in many ways. And I'm mentioning this because I hope your listeners can relate. It's a tough time in that regard and that's challenging, but probably for some kind of enrichment as well to appreciate people for where they are in their journey, have compassion for them. I'm sure there's stuff I don't know about right now that in a few years I'll say, Mark, wow, you didn't see it. Uh, but at the same time, not getting sucked in because of that, not getting sucked into the dark energy and not conforming just because other people around you are. So uh, as, uh, one thing I want to say, Alex, before I forget it, because this is important, because I have a slightly different view on spirituality than I used to. And I, I alluded to this before about protecting our soul. There's this notion I'm getting, I'm coming up with more and more just in my thinking about like this idea of a spiritual warrior having that kind of a mindset. And this relates to my, you know, I used to be a competitive tennis player. So that's how I used to be. There's something in that competitive mindset that can be applied to this. It's, it is love and light, but we've got to be tough in this, especially when you're dealing with forces that are, they infringe upon our lives. They don't just exist independently, these darker forces. So we have to be tough. We can't be weak. And that's something I don't see as much in the spiritual world. That's awesome. I, I totally love that. And you know, the other thing you kind of touched on is this kind of go along to get along kind of stuff. And that's what you're talking about. And what I'm talking about as part of the Great Reset. No, we don't need to go along to get along. We just had a we just had a like two year play drama of where that what that leads to, you know, and it doesn't mean we have to be out with torches and pitchforks and, you know, if, trying to string up everyone we see. I love the way you put it. It's just an internal toughness. And it also is in, in a way that you're talking about, you know, the, the great reset in terms of people that you're saying, you know, there's this more divide. Well, you know, the positive spin on that is you were probably wasting your time with people who were kind of stuck in a rut anyway, and a stuck mm -hmm. on stupid rut, and it wasn't really going to go anywhere. So now you have a chance to say, okay, I can I don't have to waste my time over there. I'll, I'll find these people that I really uh, can help lift me forward, not just with inspiration, but also with knowledge. And that's what your books are doing. Yeah. It, it gets to this topic of alignment and we're like, we're like being forced to be aligned. Now there's really no choice. You're living in one world or the other, and that can be very rewarding when you're in full alignment. And that's what happened with me professionally. And I'm going to say this because I, I would bet some of your audience members are in this spot too, where you're doing something that doesn't feel fully authentic and it's emotionally taxing. That's what it came to for me where I was working on clients and it's serious client work where you have to be totally focused and I'm managing teams and working on bringing in new clients, all this, trying to do all the stuff. And then I'm interested in the evolution of consciousness and reading these other topics on the side. It got to a point where I couldn't energetically do both. It was too much. It caused an internal anxiety. And when I released that and I, I gave the notice that I'd be leaving the firm, that's Shortly after that, I said, oh, there's a second book here. It was like there was an energetic block to what wanted to come in. So I mentioned that because I don't want to say that we should just sit, drop everything in our lives. I mean, I for me, it was three years of being in my job after being exposed to this. But there's something about taking a leap at a certain point when it makes sense, being rational about it, but finding that full alignment. It's critical. Okay, Mark, what's next? 
I know. Here's a guy who said he didn't even he didn't even think he had a second book after he wrote his first one. But one, how is this book going? What's the reception been like so far? And then where are you taking this project? Well, I haven't heard from all that many people. I mean, surprisingly, I, I just don't hear from that many people in general. Every now and then I do. I have heard from people that they enjoy it and some people enjoy it, but they don't want to look at the dark stuff as much, but they're happy they know about it. So that I, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I'm trying to get the word out about the books for sure. Uh, mostly because I think the information in there is really important. I would have written them otherwise. I'm writing them because I think there's it's a way to concentrate information so you don't have to spend all the time that I spent. It's in one place to learn how people are thinking about these topics. So I'm trying to get the word out more. And in terms of what's next, I am, I'm just constantly researching and I don't know what the next project is going to be. I find myself most interested in things happening in the world these days like Great Reset, et cetera, watching the news very closely. I have a Telegram channel because my Instagram channel is shadow banned. Uh, it's called Mark Gober Official, where I just share news articles. It's not with commentary, just stuff I'm interested in. I, I share it uh, because depending on the news you look at, you have a very different view of the world. And I'm just so curious about what's happening and where it's going to go and what kinds of mental shifts we're going to need to have to break through the deception. Where that leads, I don't know, but that's what I'm interested in right now. Well, fantastic. I think you're having an impact. I hear from people somewhat regularly that are influenced or pay attention to what you're doing and what you're saying. And I think it's, we're also at a time where we have to be really mindful about how we measure impact and how we measure, you know, purpose that we're having because one, we don't know, we have no idea what the numbers are. I mean, they're yeah. totally manipulating the numbers. It, it, that's clear. That's yeah. just a given. And then number two, the this point about the, the separation, it's like, you know, you, you can't compete with some of this stuff that's out there that people are drawn to. And it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it, it's crazy kind of, you know, I mean, my kids like, uh, the, you know, the Paul brothers and, you know, the box aid, all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay that's great you know that's fine but it's like millions and millions of views or even you know joe rogan which i have mixed feelings about but it's like i don't know you get one point i think you're having an impact more of an impact than you might realize and how would you know anyway you know you, you wouldn't you wouldn't know if you are or not and i wish i should add there's so many people that have had an impact on me that probably don't know that i, you know, I listen to their interviews i mean you're one of them you know but you never know when you put content out there. And I, I say that for people who don't have podcasts and don't write books. You don't know the impact you have on your daily, in your daily living. And I'll end on this because it's super important. I think about it all the time. In the life review, what people constantly say is the little things are the big things. That's what you end up evaluating in your life review. So the story I tell in, in uh, one of my books is from Dr. Jan Holden from the University of North Texas of a person who had a life review where the person remembered not being nice to the cashier and then felt how that interaction impacted every other person in line afterwards because it was an unpleasant interaction. So the little things are the big things in everything we do in life. Right on. That is so awesome. And whenever I hear those stories, they're so inspirational to me. And at the same time, just devastating to me because I realize how much growth I have to do, you know, and, and that's the beautiful thing about that is it comes back full circle because the very positive part of that is I can change that. I can fix that. I can decide to be better. I won't even say today. I can decide to be de better for the next five minutes, you know, because, yeah. and, and that feels like real spirituality to me. And as opposed to contact experiences where the angel is that it just, it doesn't feel as real as just exactly what you just said, just being a little bit better person on a, for the next five minutes. Yep. Yep. And then I will add one more last thing because there's the, the paradox of this is the overemphasis on compassion to the extent of not recognizing where one is not being compassionate. And I see that so much in the world today where we're going to focus on this one issue to be compassionate in this one circumstance but we're going to forget about how that's not being compassionate and empathetic to everyone else. There's this blinding that can happen with a certain kind of collectivism where um, there's two sides of it. So I agree with you. And then let's just be mindful at the same time. My brother, my brother, we could, we could talk for hours. It's such an important topic An end to upside down contact. Mark Gober has been our guest. Thanks again, Mark. 
Thank you again, Alex, and thanks for all the work that you're doing. Thanks again to Mark Gober for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, if we understand there's some undeniable reality to the good ET, bad ET thing, how do we then understand ET as it relates to evil? It's a big question, but we certainly teed up a lot of potential for answers in this interview. So let me hear your thoughts. I'd love for you to jump on over to the Skeptical Forum. But if you don't do that, let your voice be heard otherwise. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.